So now we are ready to begin uh, the event. Our first speaker for today is uh, Ajit Parmeshwaran. Welcome here. Ajit is an astrophysicist. He works at the International Center for Theoretical Physics at uh, Bangalore. He did his he obtained his undergraduate and master's degrees in Kerala at the universities of Calicut and Kottayam and then obtained his doctoral degree at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. Uh, he did post a postdoctoral stint at uh, in California and then came back to join the International Center for Theoretical Studies. His research area is gravitational waves. As a member of the team that discovered gravitational waves, his work has won a lot of recognition and in particular he is a recipient, one of the recipients of the Global Cosmology Award and the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. So today he is going to tell us something more, uh, some exciting things that have been happening along these lines. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to speak to you today. And I'm a bit uh, hesitant after seeing so many uh, India's bright scientists among the audience to give this very torn down talk about black holes um, uh, in, in, to this, this high power audience. But I'm going to ignore all the scientists in the audience and I'm going to talk to my, my friends from the uh, outside the domain of science. So uh, I'm hoping to tell you uh, a broad picture of how um, the understanding of black holes, which are some of the most enigmatic objects that exist in the universe, um, has been evolving over the past few decades. In particular, in the last decade in particular, our understanding, especially our um, observational understanding of black holes have been uh, increasing tremendously. Until very recently, black holes have been objects of um, theoretical studies. And uh, now we have a variety of astrophysical observations, a variety of astrophysical probes that really probe the detailed nature of black holes. And uh, here, the theoretical studies are coming hand to hand with both astrophysical astronomical observations as well as large scale computational studies. Um, and all these uh, different types of tools are uh, going hand in hand to understand some of these most enigmatic objects in the universe, which also seem to be playing a major role in our understand in the evolution of, of galaxies and so on that we that we live in. So uh, let me start in the very, very beginning. We, you know, this idea such as black holes, very early speculations of objects such as black holes existed for the last few centuries, actually. Um, most of you know that the modern understanding of black holes come through the theory of Einstein um, called the general theory of relativity, which is only a century old. But even a few centuries ago, different people have speculated on very dark and massive objects to exist in the universe. And this argument can be very, very simple. We know, for example, what would happen if you throw a stone, it would come back in this parabolic part. And, uh, and, but if you're able to throw a stone extremely fast with a velocity of about 11 kilometer per second, then this um, stone is able to overcome the gravitational attraction of the earth and can escape to the infinity. And this is called the escape velocity of the earth. And it is different for different objects. For example, for the earth, it's happened to be around 11 kilometer per second, but if in the moon, it's lower. And uh, it is sort of, it, um, it is proportional to the mass of the gravitating object like the planet. And it is, it is inversely proportional to the a size of this object, the radius of the object. So if you, for example, have an extremely dense object, which is extremely massive and, and very compact, then the escape velocity is larger. So if you, for example, try to throw a stone from the surface, quote unquote, surface of the, of, the, of the sun, that escape velocity is about 600 kilometers per second. But now, uh, there are much more exotic objects. For example, there are stars called white dwarfs which can be as massive as the sun, but can be only uh, as big as the earth. So it's an, uh, um, uh, the sun is about a million times more massive than the earth. And if you compress the whole sun into the size of the, of the earth, you get a star like a, uh, what you call a white dwarf. And you have an extremely massive object, it's very compact, and the escape velocity is you know, several thousand kilometers per second. But now we can think of creating more and more compact objects massive and compact objects, and then escape velocity will continue to rise. 
And if you are able to compress the sun into a radius of about 3 kilometers, then the escape velocity becomes a speed of light. This means that even light is unable to escape from the surface of such an object. And people, several people have speculated on the existence of such objects, even uh, well before Einstein had formulated this uh, theory of relativity. And uh, one such uh, is the famous uh, French mathematician, physicist, Pierre Simon Laplace. And he said that it is therefore possible that the greatest luminous bodies in the universe are on this account completely invisible, completely dark. And uh, we will see that this is actually a prophetic statement which happened to be true. We now know that the most massive sim single objects are what they call a supermassive black hole that weigh million times or billion times that of the sun. And they are totally black. Another person uh, who speculated on the existence of these dark objects is uh, this Englishman, English clergyman called John Mitchell. He also said that if any, although these objects are completely dark and we will be able to see them as Laplace correctly guessed, if other luminous bodies should happen to revolve around them, we might from the motions of these revolving bodies infer the existence of these dark objects. If we have other luminous objects like stars that move around this dark, totally dark object, even though we are unable to see this dark object, from the motion of these uh, surrounding objects, we could infer the presence of this dark object. And again, this happened to be true. Uh, we have the, the first evidence of, or, 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 or some of the, the first evidence of these black holes come from looking at the motion of these objects around black holes. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize was given to two astronomers who looked at the, the orbits of stars around the galactic center and inferred the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So now these are all um, speculations because we know that um, uh, Newton's gravity is not, Newton's theory is not the, the totally correct description of gravity. For example, the particle of light photon does not have a mass, so it cannot basically attract the, by uh, Newton's description of, of the gravity. The uh, most accurate theory of gravity that we have right now is due to Albert Einstein. It describes gravity as a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. Gravity produced by massive object curves the space as well as it affects the flow of time. And uh, in Einstein's theory, these space and time are not independent objects. They are part of a single entity called the space-time. And gravity basically is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. This is something very difficult to imagine. Uh, but one could actually uh, make uh, experiments. You know, this theory makes de definite predictions of what one would see uh, when the, the uh, space-time is curved by massive object like the apple or the sun or anything like that. So very, very far away from any massive objects, the space-time is totally flat. And all the usual axioms of Euclidean geometry that we learn in school are true. For example, if you draw a triangle and add the angles inside a triangle, you get 180 degrees. If you draw a circle and take a you know, ratio between the diameter and the circumference, circumference and the diameter of the circle, you get a constant called the pi, etc., etc., and parallel lines never meet, and so on and so forth. But in the vicinity of massive object, the space-time seems to be a totally flat object. Um, and all these axioms that we learn in school will cease to be true. However, mathematicians of the 19th century have developed ways of describing geometry in curved spaces. And Einstein was able to describe, create a theory that describes the physical world, the, the physical phenomenon called gravity, using a geometric picture. And uh, the, you know, he was able to write down a set of equations similar to the Newton's equations of gravity and Newton's equations of motion, which are combined in the so-called Einstein's equations. And uh, you know, it tells that this left part is some mathematical quantity that describes the curvature of space-time. And the right hand describes a mathematical quantity that describes all the matter, energy, and momentum content in the, in, in that, in that space-time. And basically, uh, this, um, this right hand side tells you how you know amount of matter and energy curve the space time. It is described by that. And again, this curved space time describes how particles, how objects move in that curved space time. And this is, for example, how the orbits of planets is described totally by the curvature of space time produced by the sun as well as 
uh, the other object in the solar system. There's a very famous uh, statement by the American physicist John Wheeler. Uh, he says, the space time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space time how to curve. So, these are the, uh, although these, um, these, this, the simple look of, of these equations are totally um, deceiving, they are a, a set of very complicated second order partial differential equations, which are very, very difficult to solve in general. However, within a year after Einstein came up with this theory of general relativity and then Einstein's equations, this uh, German um, astrophysicist and physicist Karl Schwarzschild came up with a first solution, mathematical solutions that satisfy this um, Einstein's equations. And it turns out that these Schwarzschild um, uh, solution, which is like a, a dramatic story by itself, you know, Schwarzschild described, you know, uh, basically discovered this mathematical solution while serving in the first world war, literally working out, sitting in a trench. And um, this basically, this, uh, this solution describes a curvature of space time around a spherically symmetric object. And uh, later, by studying uh, the, these mathematical properties of this, this solution, people have found that this contains some very interesting features. For example, this, um, the center part um, uh, of, 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 uh, of this solution, basically all the, the Einstein's equations themselves break down. It falls on what is called a singularity. We, we cannot solve Einstein equations at this point. And also, very interestingly, it forms a particular radius from the center. Um, it forms a surface called the event horizon. And everything basically goes inward. It's a totally one-way street. Uh, things that once go uh, inside it can never come outside. Even light um, cannot come outside from a region inside this horizon of the black hole. And uh, this horizon, this particular, um, uh, in the case of a simplest black hole of a spherically symmetric black hole, this sort of the radius of this event horizon um, has a, a simple relationship to the mass of this, this object. Um, it is about, it's called 2 gm by c square. And uh, to honor um, Schwarzschild, it is called the Schwarzschild black hole. For example, the Schwarzschild, sorry, Schwarzschild radius. The, the size, the Schwarzschild radius of the sun is about 3 kilometers. This means that if you are able to compress the sun into a radius of about 3 kilometers, it means that not even light will be able to escape from that surface. It forms a black hole. Now, um, basically, uh, how do we, under, what is the, you know, uh, so we, we, we cannot, uh, the understanding of this black hole as in terms of the escape velocities of the, of the black hole is, it turns out to be not the right way of describing this, this effect. Uh, what there are multiple ways of thinking it. No, I told you that basically um, gravity, gravitational fields basically cause the curvature of space as well as the curvature of time. The curvature of time means time runs slower in gravitational fields as compared to a, as observed by an observer who is sitting far away and observing this gravitating object. This means that if you were able to place a, a clock very close to the horizon and if a distant observer is looking at the time uh, difference between the ticking of the clocks, they would see that the, the clocks would take longer and li longer time to tick between two consecutive ticks. Uh, on the other, you know, a different way of looking at this effect, this is called basically that, you know, the, the gravity dilates time, the time taken by the, uh, the, the two consecutive ticks is larger as you go to deeper and deeper gravitational well. Uh, Alternatively, if you have a ray of light coming out of this, uh, this deep gravitating region near the horizon of the black hole, the light will take some energy to climb out of this gravitational potential well, and the light has to lose energy. And it means that the frequencies of the light will get to uh, lower and lower frequencies, to redder and redder colors. This is called gravitational redshift. And at the horizon, this gravitational redshift is infinite. Basically, the, all the frequencies of light becomes zero or the periods becomes infinite. This means that the horizon is completely invisible to an outside observer. No light can reach from the horizon to an outside observer. And whatever object that fall into this 
event horizon, including light, would invariably go and reach the singularity of the black hole where all the current laws of physics break down. And this is something very um, hard for anyone to digest, especially for physicists who would like to have some regularity in the world. And uh, although Einstein is very impressed by this mathematical solution of Einstein's equations, even he did not believe that these could describe actual physical objects in the universe. And in the 1930s or so, it was a big debate, you know, for example, uh, whether objects like this could exist in the universe. And in fact, it turns out that very massive stars can collapse at the end of their lifetime to become black holes. So, um, if you remember, basically, uh, these stars are produced by nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion reactions that happen at the interior of stars. And basically, the gravity tries to collapse a star, but the amount of heat as well as the pressure of the outgoing light, outgoing radiation, basically supports the infall of matter due to its gravitational contraction. And the, the stars are in an equilibrium between this gravity and the radiation and the thermal pressure. And once the star runs out of its nuclear fuel, basically there is nothing to balance against the gravitational contraction and these stars would collapse into a black hole. And this was actually rigorously proved by uh, two scientists, uh, physicists Oppenheimer and Snyder in the 1930s uh, using a very rigorous mathematical calculation. And they showed that when all thermonuclear reaction sources of the energy are exhausted, a sufficiently star would collapse to form a singularity at the center. It's a very intriguing episode at the same time, a, um, a few years ago, there was a paper by, written by a person called B. Dutt in Kolkata, which essentially made very similar conclusions. And this paper was actually published in a German journal, but was not noticed very widely. In fact, we know very little about this person called B. Dutt. Only about um, five, six years ago, uh, from some of our colleague, senior, senior colleagues from the Indian General Activity Association, Naresh Tadis, et cetera, basically looked at the records of the Presidency College and found out that Bidat was actually a student of a famous Indian relativist called N. R. Sen in Kolkata. And um, unfortunately, he died uh, very young, so he published only one paper. And uh, it had a very, you know, very remarkable uh, result, which was sort of not seen by the world for a very, very long time. In fact, now many people now call this gravitational collapse as Oppenheimer, Snyder, and Dutt gravitational collapse. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, epoch in the, in the history of Indian science. But if you sort of go on, um, uh, indeed, Oppenheimer and Snyder uh, were the ones who fully understood the physical implication of this mathematical solution that that also has found. And uh, they made this uh, remarkable uh, uh, conclusion. However, this calculation was assuming certain idealized properties of the star that would collapse to form this, this star size singularity. And they assumed that these stars are comprised of idealized dust that um, produce no pressure, and also totally, completely spherically symmetric. And uh, this actually ha caused a lot of suspicion among um, a lot of physicists, because we know that the spherical symmetry is an idealized concept. There is nothing totally spherically symmetric in the universe, except perhaps black holes. So, a lot of people suspected that even small deviations of the spherical symmetry or even small amount of pressure would basically uh, break the assumptions that Oppenheimer and Snyder used to arrive at this remarkable result. However, in the uh, 1960s, uh, Roger Penrose, a very uh, eminent mathematician and, and theoretical physicist, essentially proved that under some very general uh, set of assumptions, a sufficiently massive object would collapse and a formation of a singularity is inevitable. This is uh, proven without assuming any spherical symmetry in a very uh, fairly you know, generic uh, assumptions which would uh, be valid in, in, in physical situations. And in fact, Penrose was given the Nobel Prize in a couple of years ago for this uh, remarkable uh, result that basically um, um, underlined the possibility of the existence of, of black holes in, in the real uh, universe. So far, 
people have been uh, trying to ask the questions could black holes exist in the universe. But whether do black holes exist in the universe a different question. This it is um, need to be probed by experiments and observation. And uh, in again the 1960s radio astronomers were starting to observe some very very weird uh, observational phenomena. So, they discovered several extremely bright objects that come from very different very distant parts of the universe. So, if you see a very bright object it can have two reasons it could be a you know not a very bright object, but by some very close um, distances like this bright uh, source of light or it could be a really extremely luminous object coming from the distant universe. And it turns out that people were able to measure its distances and these objects called quasars or active galactic nuclei etcetera seem to be coming from the real edges of the visible universe. So, and people try to explain what could be powering these extremely luminous objects and they come up with all kinds of ideas nuclear fusion did not work. Turns out that the nuclear the budget that is required to produce this kind of luminosity is not produced by any nuclear reactions. So, one has to invoke gravity. So, the only possible explanation is that it is basically the gravitational potential energy of matter that is falling into some very compact supermassive object that can explain this kind of energy budget. So, one could you now it is sort of similar to how meteorites fall into the earth right because of their potential energy is converted to extremely high speeds then and due to the friction they would burn and produce this very luminous uh, flares when they reach um, the earth and they are sufficient enough to then wipe out whole species uh, and where they are able to you know uh, successful in, in you know, wiping out entire species like dinosaurs in the earth. So, there are uh, much more uh, dramatic mega versions of these happening in these objects. You have some super massive object like billions of so, uh, millions to billions of solar masses black holes and gas falling from uh, very large distances into these objects and heating up and producing this extremely luminous object and jets that have that have a size of several thousand light years. So, here is a an object uh, uh, at the center of the galaxy called Cygnus A which is launching a very powerful jet it is 3D on radio observations and it is the size of the jet is several thousands of light years. At the same time again, so this is again where um, uh, Laplace's prediction um, uh, seem to be true. These are the, the, the supermassive black holes are the single most massive objects that we know in the universe. They could be millions to billion times as massive as the sun, but they are totally dark. However, we can see their effect on their environment you know, when the gas falls from distance uh, and onto the surface of the black hole. Although we cannot see the black hole this falling in produce friction, friction and heat and they radiate in a, a entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. We also see a micro versions of these in our own galaxy also and here is an example of a star usual star that is orbiting around a much smaller black hole of about 10 solar mass. And again this black hole would accrete matter this matter would gas would fall into the black hole and uh, it can produce an uh, it could heat up and produce a jet. And here is a, an actual image the middle uh, 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 image shows an x-ray image of a very powerful source of x-rays in our galaxy called the Cygnus X1. And by studying the time variation of these um, um, these x-ray uh, x-ray light curve one could uh, identify the periodicity of the source and also one could um, measure something called a Doppler shift because of the relative motion of these um, uh, these star around the black hole and one can infer the mass of the center of the present central object by looking at the motion of the star around these uh, these black holes it's called mi micro quasar. And, um, and we have uh, several can ob observations of such objects in our own galaxy. In fact, astronomers now believe that there are about 10 million such, such small black holes in our own galaxy. And our galaxy is just one among about um, 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So, the universe is littered with black holes practically. And again here comes uh, John Mitchell's prediction that if luminous bodies uh, should revolve around these dark objects, we should be able to infer their presence through the observation of this light from these luminous objects. Um, now, so until sort of uh, you know 60s or 70s this were the only ways of um, observing black holes in fact, you know uh, very recently until very recently about 80s. 
And but starting from 90s, astronomers started to probe the nature of black holes at much closer separations, much much closer um, uh, distances. In fact, try to get close-ups of the black holes. And here, uh, we should remember that basically the orbits of objects around black holes, they are far away from the black hole, they are not very different from the orbits of usual planets, for example. So, for example, this is the, the orbits of the planets in our solar system, the left um, image. And if you were to replace the sun by a black hole of the same mass, the orbits of all the planets would be practically the same. So, the black holes are not going to ever everything in the solar system. No one needs to worry about that. However, if you go to, and in fact, this is how uh, two teams of astronomers essentially weighed the mass, the, the, the mass of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So let's look at the animation. This animation basically shows the observation of uh, stars in the center of our galaxy in a region called Sagittarius, um, and this constellation called Sagittarius. And these astronomers were tracking these star over a decade or, or, or two, in fact, two, more than two decades. So each of these luminous objects is a star, and you could see the, the year in the top uh, right part. The observation starts in 1995 and goes all the way to 2016 or so. And in this period, you can see this, this, these stars are completing uh, an orbit or so. And uh, they seem to be orbiting around a dark object, which we do not see. It's, and this location can be now identified by studying the orbits of, of these stars, just like we can measure the location of the sun from the orbits of the planets. And just like we can measure the mass of the sun by looking at the orbits of planets, these astronomers essentially may measure the mass of these supermassive compact objects also. And it turns out that this center of the galaxy, this region called the Sagittarius A star, hosts a supermassive compact object that weighs about 4 million solar masses. <laughs> and uh, these uh, uh, two people, Reinhard Genzel from Germany and Andrea Guess from um, US, they led the two different teams of astronomers which arrived basically at the same conclusions using two different telescopes by observing the same set of stars. And they discovered the presence of a supermassive compact object at the center of a galaxy through precision observations of the star, the motion of stars around, the, uh, uh, around it. And they also shared the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Penrose. Now, um, so still, um, as I said earlier, these orbits are basically you know, several thousand Schwarzschild radii away from the, the black hole. So they do not see the strong gravity of black hole. They just orbit these black hole, just like our planets orbit the sun. So we do not see any particular dramatic effect to the black hole. To see the dramatic effects of the black hole, one has to zoom in further. And here is uh, these, um, the, the right height shows the uh, like a zoomed version of this orbit of the stars that uh, I showed in the previous animation. And if you zoom in in the, in the, in the middle, at the center, there, is, there should be a, a dark object. And here, if this object is indeed black hole, one should see some dramatic um, uh, departures as compared to a usual object like, the star, uh, like a star. One is that, as we expect, this black hole should feature a dark surface called the horizon, which things can only go, in, um, go inside and nothing can come outside. And outside that, uh, you know, about three times that Schwarzschild radius, there seems to be uh, an orbit. So, um, in according to Newtonian gravity, basically you can have, you know, a planet can orbit around a black hole at arbitrary close to the horizon. But according to Einstein's theory, this is not true. It turns out that if you go a certain closeness to the, to the, to the black hole, about three times the gravitational radius, then it means that you cannot have a stable orbit around this black hole. It has to go inward or it has come out. And even dramatically, about 1.5 the gravitational radius, even light would form a ring around the black hole. A, like a, a photon would perpetually orbit the black hole, forming a ring of photons or a light a sphere around the black hole. And these are things that one could potentially observe if you are able to image this black hole at very close um, uh, contact. And again, here comes a very uh, uh, interesting um, uh, observation that happened in the last decade. 
um, a team of radio astronomers using the best radio telescopes across the world tried to actually take a picture of the of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So this is called the Event Horizon Telescope. The idea is to use you know, different radio telescopes located at different parts of the world and synthesize a synthetic telescope that is as big as the size of the Earth, a radio telescope as big as the Earth. It's done in software, only software. All the data is taken separately and brought in, and the synthetic telescope was constructed in totally in software. And it turns out that now you can, the angular resolution that you can probe is very small using this very long baseline interferometry. And it turns out that if you peer the center of the galaxy, then you could actually create a, an image of this region. And they did see this dark region, which we believe is the horizon. And you see this luminous uh, ring, of, which is produced by the infalling gas around, around this, um, this, this black hole. And the shadow is an indication that there is a black hole, there's a dark object sitting there, which is um, unable to produce any more light. However, it is still not clear whether this is a close-up of a black hole or something else. Because theorists are good at creating you know, synth uh, artificial objects, which, you know, which are totally consistent with Einstein's theory. And just like the black holes were a very exotic object at some point, but now they are commonplace, theorists are able to construct more such exotic objects, such as boson stars, or, or wormholes, or, or grava stars, etc. They all are these very compact objects. They can have uh, sizes comparable to the black hole, but they are slightly bigger. But all of them would uh, produce shadows like this. These are, these are um, um, a theoretical calculations that shows what kind of images would these exotic objects would produce if they are not black holes. For example, a usual black hole would produce an image like this, but if it's a, a different kind of a black hole, it would produce an image like this, and, and so on and so forth. And current observations are not accurate enough to tell apart whether what we are seeing is indeed a black hole predicted by Einstein's theory or something else. So one has to gain further zoom in to, to see if we see further um, a detailed, if we see any imprint of uh, further more detailed uh, nature of these objects imprinted in any kind of observations, either in electromagnetic phase or something else. And here, astronomers were um, uh, blessed with uh, another new tool. Uh, this is called the gravitational waves. And here, these are gravitational waves are basically ripples in space time created by moving objects. So I told you that the proposition of Einstein's theory is that massive objects would curve space-time around them. And these objects move around each other with some acceleration. They produce disturbances in the curvature of space-time. And they propagate at the speed of light. And they're called gravitational waves. And uh, this is a, a numerical simulation, a, a numerical calculation using large supercomputers that shows how the space-time is disturbed, how these, how these space-time disturbances propagate when two black holes uh, orbit around each other, losing energy and finally colliding with each other. And the, the corresponding, and, and this has a very um, a clear and a peculiar signature in the gravitational waveform. So you can see this below, this is the expected gravitational waves produced by this coalescence of such, such um, objects. And uh, these two LIGO observatories, these are the large observatories that look for these ripples in space-time called gravitational waves, indeed observed such a chirping signal first in 2015. And um, in the last uh, seven years, LIGO and its sort of sister observatory called Virgo in USA have observed gravitational waves from about 100 such mergers of black holes happening at different, uh, different regions in the universe. And this shows that like a, a zoo of the black holes discovered by LIGO and Virgo. For example, this vertical axis shows the mass of these objects uh, producing gravitational waves. And all these blue dots are the black holes discovered by LIGO and Virgo through the observation of gravitational waves. They all happen at different distant galaxies, which are about billions of light years away from us. And uh, in comparison, these crimson dots are the black holes discovered by X-ray observations from our own galaxy. So we are uncovering a totally new way of studying the black hole. And this has a sort of a nicer property because essentially uh, these gravitational waves would contain imprints of the detailed nature of these objects in them. So for example, 
the gravitational wave signals produced by a black hole, a colliding black hole, and two colliding grava stars would have a different signature because you know the because this um, uh, if you replace this boundary, this event horizon by something else, they would have an imprint on the gravitational wave signals. Uh, they are very weak. These imprints are very weak, and one has to have very more, much more uh, precise observations, which are um, expected in the in the next few years. In fact. So far, LIGO has observed about 100 gravitational signals, but just in the next year, we'll be observing about 400 gravitational signals with improved sensitivity. So in the next decade or so, these gravitational wave observations would open up a totally new way of observing these compact objects, which we believe to be black hole. So this is the simplest observation uh, explanation that we can give. However, nature might have a surprise for us. We don't know. So let me stop and uh, summarize. Um, we know that, so Einstein's theory predicts the existence of black holes, and these are black holes are basically a singularity that is covered by a horizon, which is a one-way uh, membrane, and uh, they can be formed through the collapse of massive stars, and uh, black holes appear to the simplest macroscopic objects in the universe. It is counterintuitive, they are very, describe, you know, describe some very enigmatic and complex physics, but if you, it turns out that if you want to describe the, a, a, a black hole has only three properties. It has a mass, it has an angular momentum, how fast it rotates, and an electric charge. If you have these three properties, you can describe the entire properties of black holes and their collisions just using these properties. So this is a very funny name, has black holes of no hair. There is a, a cartoon by Indian black hole physicist C.V. Vishweshara on Occam, um, um, basically cleaning, the, shaving the, the hairs of black hole using his razor. And if quantum mechanical effects are um, um, considered, it, it, it appears that black hole is not totally dark. It emits a radiation called, just named after uh, Hawking and, and Bekenstein. Observationally, we, we have a very large body of observational evidence coming from different types of observations that suggest that objects like black holes would exist in the universe. And we are sure that the stellar mass objects, you know, masses a few times the mass of the sun exist. We also know that there are these billions of, uh, millions to billion uh, so solar mass objects called supermassive black holes at the center of practically all galaxies in the universe. There is a possibility that some intermediate mass black holes also exist, which have a mass of about 100 to 1,000 solar masses. Uh, it is not clear how these supermassive black holes are produced. We know that they exist. For example, our own galaxy has, has it, and many galaxies have it. But it is not clear what is the astrophysical mechanism in which they are produced. It's a bit of an enigma still. Um, and, uh, but they seem to play a very important role in the evolution of galaxies in the cosmic time. There is a very tight relation between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy itself. And we are uh, starting to probe some very fundamental predictions of the nature of black holes. For example, the existence of light ring, the horizon, etc., through a variety of observations using these millimeter radio observations or gravitational waves, etc. But we are still not sure are these really the black holes predicted by Einstein's theory or something more exotic? And that can be answered only by uh, upcoming observations and theoretical studies. Let me stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. So I do have a, some, a few questions for you from the audience. Maybe we can come sure. back. So the first question is by Pramod N. from his uh, school class six student. He asks, if a black hole swallows a planet like Earth, will there still be life on the planet? And yeah. if the full universe is swallowed by a black hole, what will happen to the black hole and what will happen to the rest of the universe? I will answer the first question. The second is harder. Uh, if um, if the uh, a planet is swallowed by a black hole, even uh, well before it is, it goes inside the event horizon, it basically gets you no. Know, it's a term called spaghettification. Basically, the tidal forces of this uh, black hole is so large that it will get basically stretched in a cigar-like shape. Basically, though, you know, the one side of the planet would see a much a stronger gravitational field as compared to the other, the far end, will get totally stretched, which would rip apart the entire, uh, entire uh, planet apart. We haven't seen this effect in real planets, but we do repeatedly, repeatedly see this black hole ripping of stars. 
that is called tidal disruption of stars, and they produce this very large flares, which astronomers have uh, have uh, seen in, in electromagnetic observations. So this is something that the astronomers have seen, uh, at least in the case of stars. Now, the entire universe, um, you know, it's a very hard thing to imagine, but uh, you could, you know, you could somehow put uh, all the matter into the black hole and becomes becomes larger and larger, but still. Right, uh, uh, sufficiently far away from the black hole, everything else can continue as, as they seem to. Because black holes seem black holes have a very limited sphere of influence, so they are not dangerous if you don't go very close to them. Thank you. Um, the next question is by uh, posed by Vijay Bala on Facebook. Uh, Vijay asks, if everything is singularly pulled inside with no chance of coming out, won't there be a limit to how much? or how many physical bodies it can pull? Will they just disintegrate? Will they vanish? Yeah, you're probably alluding to a question, a big problem called the information loss paradox, right? Uh, so it, it seems there is no real limit. For example, the black hole can grow arbitrarily as far as you supply enough matter, it'll just go more and more massive. But there is a question of, you know, if, uh, you know, you basically, the, if you feed a black hole with the TV sets or planets or stars, Basically, if you describe all these objects, it requires a huge amount of information to describe the microscopic degrees of freedom of each of these objects. But once it forms a black hole, it is described by just three properties. So where did all this information go? It's a big puzzle, and it's called the information law paradox. And a lot of theoretical physicists believe that the answer could be in the quantum gravity. For example, you know, uh, the black hole emits some radiation called the Hawking radiation. And if you look at the microscopic degrees of freedom of that radiation, all the information is there. But I am not an expert on this field, so uh, there are much more expertise in the audience here who can correct me. Okay. So I think we have time for one, one more question. Uh, this is a question from Rajesh Rajgopalan. Do all stars at the end of their life turn to black holes? No, that's a good question. That, uh, it turns out uh, that light stars like the sun, they would undergo a different kind of process and they would end uh, their life as so what are called white dwarfs. I, I alluded at the beginning of this talk, and slightly more massive stars would collapse, and, and they form uh, a bit more exotic object called neutron stars, where the pressure, uh, basically the gravity is balanced by the what you call the degeneracy pressure of, of neutrons. But very massive stars, about more than about 15 solar mass, uh, would collapse to form black holes. Okay. Thank you very much. There are still quite a few questions here, but I think in the interests of time, we will stop this now. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody here that at the end of all the four talks, we will have another question answer session where we will take questions for all the four talks. So maybe we will have a chance to revisit, uh, not to revisit, to visit some of the unanswered questions at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much.